In the last video, we talked about principal components analysis and linear dimensionality reduction. We did touch briefly on kernel PCA, which enables some degree of non-linear fitting by projecting into high dimensional spaces using the kernel trick, as with support vector machines. But there are other methods for doing non-linear dimensionality reduction, and I'll just briefly describe a couple of those. In all cases, the idea is to take data that belongs on some non-linear low-dimensional manifold embedded in a higher dimensional space and project it down into a lower dimensional space that preserves the connectivity or the relationships between the different samples within that manifold. One of the defining properties of a manifold is that at a very local level it looks Euclidean or linear. So many of these methods involve uh, defining local neighbourhoods within the space and then viewing those through a kind of linear lens. And the neighbourhoods tend to be uh, defined using a simple local search like uh, k nearest neighbours. One thing though about most of these methods is that they don't really model the manifold as such, they just find a projection of the data that maintains some of the relationships. This is useful for visualisation and that is what it's most often used for, but it doesn't tend to generalise well to new data samples. So as a learning procedure, it's more descriptive and analytic than it is uh, allowing you to make predictions in future. By contrast, PCA projects the entire high dimensional space into a lower dimensional subspace and that projection applies anywhere to new data in the high dimensional space. So one useful tool for this uh, lower dimensional visualization is known as multi-dimensional scaling. This is not specifically a non-linear dimensionality reduction technique, but it's a tool that is used by other nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques. Multidimensional scaling, in fact, is a family of different related techniques that uh, all work towards the same kind of goal, which is to take a matrix of pairwise differences between sample points um, which may be the Euclidean distances between them or some other dissimilarity metric. It takes this matrix and it produces a low dimensional projection which as far as possible preserves the distances between all of the points. There are two common related but distinct loss functions which are used for optimizing multidimensional scaling and these are known as stress and strain. The stress um, attempts to minimize the errors in the distances between points in the reconstruction, whereas the strain attempts to minimize uh, centered dot products between the different vectors. If the measure of dissimilarity used in the dissimilarity matrix is the Euclidean distance and the loss function being optimized is the strain, then multidimensional scaling turns out to be equivalent to principal components analysis and the low dimensional projection is the same as you would get by taking the first that many dimensions of the principal components. This version of multidimensional scaling known as classical or Torgerson MDS is susceptible to efficient solution via the singular value decomposition. Other forms of multidimensional scaling require uh, custom iterative optimization processes. So multidimensional scaling is used as a tool in a nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique known as isomap or isometric mapping. In isomap, 
Uh, local neighborhoods are identified for each point using the K nearest neighbors algorithm. And that is used to build a set of local distances to the locally connected points. These individual neighborhoods are then used to build a larger scale graph of all of the points, but only taking into account the local distance relationships. And then a global distance or dissimilarity matrix is constructed by uh, navigating the global graph using a shortest path algorithm, so to determine the distances between the far away points. This is then passed to multidimensional scaling to generate the low dimensional projection of the high dimensional points. Another similar method for manifold learning is known as locally linear embedding, which again identifies neighborhoods using K nearest neighbors and then constructs a linear fit of each point as a linear combination of its surrounding neighbors. All of these fits are then aggregated together and jointly optimized to produce the low dimensional projection, which preserves the uh, local linear relationships between a point and its neighbors. A very popular technique for uh, nonlinear dimensionality reduction is T-SNE or T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. This is very widely used for visualization, almost exclusively for projecting into 2D or 3D for plotting points from high dimensional spaces in a uh, visually understandable way. As the word stochastic in the name suggests, TSNE is a uh, probabilistic model. And it works by modeling the proximity or distance relationships in the high dimensional space uh, using Gaussian distributions. So for each point, its probability of being a neighbor of any other point drops off with a Gaussian bell kind of formulation with the distance between the two. This is very similar to the distance metric used in a radial basis function kernel in uh, support vector machines. However, in T-SNE, the standard deviation or variance of the bell, this uh, drop-off with distance, varies with the local point density. It is adaptive across the data set. T-SNE then constructs a low-dimensional set of points corresponding to the high-dimensional points and defines a distribution for that as well. But in this case, the drop-off with distance follows a student's t-distribution with one degree of freedom, which means that it has fatter tails. So in the low dimensional space, distance is penalized less than it is in the high dimensional space. The low dimensional embedding is then optimized by minimizing the uh, kullback lieber divergence, which in this case is very similar to the cross entropy loss between the two distributions. So finding a set of uh, point positions for your low dimensional embedding, which has the lowest possible uh, cross entropy or uh, KL divergence loss. One notable thing about TSNE is that it has quite a few hyperparameters for the optimization, and these can very drastically affect the results that you get out of it. Also, because it's stochastic, you don't get the same projection every time you run it. You can get all kinds of different arrangements that will be similar in overall distribution, but may look quite different. TSNE is very popular because it produces nice visualizations that can be quite intuitive. It is very slow to run, and it is very variable in terms of the results that you get out. It can be good at projecting clusters in the high dimensional space into reasonably separated clusters in the low dimensional embedding. However, it can also produce these as artifacts when they aren't really there. So it is important to play with the hyperparameters to get decent results out. There's a very good article on distill, which I will link in the slides. Uh, which describes this process in some detail. So all of these processes are ways of trying to 
force a high dimensional set of data points into a lower dimensional space in some way that preserves some of the relationships between them. Another way of thinking about this is as attempting to find a representation of the points in the high dimensional space that captures useful information about them. Now, as discussed last week, we can also view the layers in multilayer perceptrons and other neural networks as doing a similar kind of thing. They take the inputs and they construct some useful representation of the inputs with respect to the downstream tasks that are going to be performed by later layers. So they're mapping their inputs into a feature representation which has some utility. We can equivalently see this as projecting the inputs into a new basis or embedding them in a different space. When the neural network layers have nonlinear activation functions, that allows them to learn nonlinear embeddings. We can extract the features of these embeddings and use them as representations of the input data. It is exactly this process that makes transfer learning useful. When we're working in the unsupervised setting, we don't have labels for our data. But one thing that we do have, which we can use in a supervisory fashion, is the data itself. We can construct tasks where the output label, which we're optimizing with respect to, is derived directly from the input data or is just the input data itself. Very roughly speaking, we can term this kind of approach as self-supervised learning. So some of the tasks that we might construct for this would be to reproduce exactly the input data after having passed through some kind of bottleneck which prevents the network from just learning the identity mapping. Models that perform this kind of task are known as autoencoders, and we will discuss them more in week Nine. Another kind of self-supervised task is to undo some kind of perturbation which you've applied to the input data. So for example, you might add noise to the input and then use the original noise-free data as the target that the model has to reconstruct. Or you might omit parts of the original data and ask the model to fill in the bits that you've omitted. Another kind of self-supervised task is to identify fragments of an input sample that belong to the same input sample and distinguish fragments that come from different input samples. All of these kinds of tasks can be used to build useful feature representations which we can then take away and use for other purposes. One particularly important kind of task that neural network layers are used to achieve is to construct an embedding of some kind of data into a different space where the source data is discrete and the target space is continuous. This is used in particular with words in language modeling. If you have a linear layer and you pass to it a discrete input in a one hot encoded fashion, then the output that you'll get from the layer, ignoring any activations, is just the row of weights in the layer corresponding to that one hot input. So this is kind of a dictionary lookup. You're just pulling out a single representative vector from your uh, embedding layer. This can be a way of mapping from lots of individual discrete inputs to uh, shared representation as vectors in a lower but still usually pretty high dimensional space. Let's say these are words in your vocabulary and you've got a hundred thousand words. Each of those can be then mapped to a vector in a continuous space, let's say 300 dimensions is quite often used. And the linear layer that receives the one hot input will just look up the appropriate mapping and pass it on. When you start out, this layer will likely be initialized randomly. And so each of the individual vectors that are associated with the words or other discrete inputs will be 
completely meaningless. They will just be pointing to random positions in this 300 dimensional space. But as you train the network for some task, it will gradually optimize the representations so that they are useful for that task by updating the weights in the embedding layer. So ultimately, after you've trained on the task for a long time, you'll have a layer consisting of dictionary lookups for all of your words where those words are represented in some meaningful fashion in this 300 or whatever dimensional continuous space. This kind of approach can be used for any discrete input and uh, deep learning frameworks like PyTorch and Keras uh, both include embedding layers that will do this kind of task for you. But as mentioned, probably the most common application for this kind of process is in word embeddings. So the job of a word embedding is to provide a mapping, a dictionary lookup from your very large vocabulary of input words into a space which preserves some kind of coherent semantic or syntactic properties of the words and how they relate. The learning of this embedding can be directly associated with the task that you want to solve, but also it's quite often done separately as a process that just learns the word embeddings, which you can then transfer to other tasks. Quite a few pre-trained embeddings, trained on very large text corpora, are available off the shelf that you can use as a pre-processing step for your own uh, language processing tasks. The training for these embeddings may use any number of different kinds of models to actually perform the task and any number of different tasks to drive the loss and optimize the embedding. For example, they might use recurrent networks that keep track of the sequence of the input sentences. But some common examples of word embeddings just use co-occurrence statistics within some smallish window. So which words commonly appear next to or nearby other words. A popular example of this is a word embedding known as word to vec So the training process for the word to vec vectors uh, is pretty much exactly as described earlier in respect to the embedding layer. The tasks for which the embedding layer is optimized, well, there are two different ones, both tested. One is known as the continuous bag of words task. And in that task, you take chunks of text, you remove one word, you throw the other words at the model and ask it to figure out what the missing word was. The other task, known as the continuous skip gram task, does basically the opposite. It presents the model with a single word taken from a short snippet of text, and it asks the model to predict the other words surrounding it, the context words. For both of these tasks, the words are taken in an unordered fashion from the short snippets of text, so the model doesn't care about the sequencing of the words, just the proximity. It turns out that word to vec trained with the continuous skip gram task uh, significantly outperforms the continuous bag of word task, uh, but it does take a lot longer to train. An interesting property of word to vec and several other kinds of word embeddings is that they exhibit some kind of semantic and syntactic coherence in the embedding space. A notorious example is that words that relate to one another in similar ways have similar vector um, differences in the embedding space. So the word embedding in itself is able to answer some simple questions of the form, if the relationship between A and B is this, what is the corresponding word that has that relationship to C? Examples would be, as man is to king, so woman is to what, and the model will be able to come up with queen. Or as Paris is to France, 
Tokyo is to what? And again, it would be able to answer Japan. These kinds of questions can be posed as a sort of vector arithmetic in the embedding space. You subtract one word vector from another, and then you add the resulting uh, displacement vector to some other word and find the word that's near it at its destination. One important point to note about these kind of embeddings is that although they project into a continuous space, the continuous space is only sparsely populated by the actual words. There is no inverse function to exactly compute uh, the word corresponding to an arbitrary location in the space. So you can only invert the function by looking at nearby points where there are actually words. So word to vec and these kinds of embeddings trained on very large bodies of existing text. And so they learn properties from that text. And some of the things that they learn can be a bit unsavory. So if you are training on everything that's ever been written, lots of that will be just rubbish. As Sturgeon's law puts it, 90% of everything is crap. And one of the things that word embeddings can pick up from the bodies of text that they have been processing is what uh, human resources people would call unconscious bias, where they assume certain kinds of relationships attached to certain kinds of nouns. So for example, like the man-king, woman-queen relationship is relatively uncontentious, but the corresponding translation from man to doctor applied to woman seems to come up with something like nurse, imposing an assumption that women can't be doctors. This is probably not a good look in a generic language model. So a similar word embedding, which indeed draws on word to vec amongst a number of other sources, is known as concept net, or in fact the downloadable embeddings are known as concept net number batch. These word embeddings are trained with a kind of semantic knowledge graph, and one of the things that they attempt to do is to combat the unconscious bias learned in the embeddings. This actually seems to make them perform better, even if you aren't worried about the innate sexism and racism of your language model. We'll talk a bit more about large language models and the things that they inadvertently learn from gigantic bodies of text in week 9, and we'll talk about ethics and fairness again in week 10.